This episode of Twin Cities Trekkies is brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, let me explain. First of all, it's free. There are creation tools that help you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. They'll also help you to distribute your podcast so it can be heard on many different platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's all you need in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Uh, welcome to episode 39 of Twin Cities Trekkies. I am Wes. And I'm Kenzie. And today we're going to talk about Jonathan Archer. Uh, this mm-hmm. is number controversial. five. But... <laughs> controversial but yeah. amazing. Yeah, controversial but amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to talk about him and stuff like that. So to get in touch with us, it is simple. Send us an email at tctrekkiespodcast at gmail.com. Feel free to send us an email with anything you'd like to say about archer or anything else that we've done in the last year or so granted it's all good with us so and if you have any comments about it you can comment on our facebook and instagram post the handle is tc trekkies pod and also if you have a voice message of any kind just go to anchor.fm slash twin cities trekkies hit that little message button and turn on your microphone so you can start recording your voice but just keep in mind that any feedback you do leave, vocal or written, may be featured in a future episode of Twin Cities Trekkies. Jonathan Archer, <laughs> I, the fifth, it's, fifth character it, analysis. He's such an interesting, like, I guess I, because we're, I mean, like the reason why we chose him to be fifth rather than like first is because we're trying to follow it along like the series more than yeah. that he's retroactively written to be a prequel to the Star Trek series that started mm-hmm. everything, which yeah. I always thought was very interesting. It's like, we're just going to write in this captain, you know, hundred years before Kirk and you know create a little bit of this backstory of the Federation so it always felt kind of Mm -hmm. cool to do that but also that's a really big undertaking and it often is met with a lot of criticism and controversy because a lot of people have not good things to say about Enterprise some people think it's pretty great or at least the later seasons but Mm -hmm. I've heard back and forth just so much about people either absolutely hating it or liking it until the end or just loving it so it's kind of all over the place i agree 100 percent. and scott vacuo was the only person they had considered for the role of him of archer there hasn't been any reports that no other actor was considered for the role um at first, uh, Scott Vacu was a little bit hesitant yeah. about about the role, but then uh, when he understood was um, if it was he didn't want to be the next captain after Catherine Janeway. Yeah, but 
when the producer, when Brian and Braga and Rick Berman approached him and said, hey, we're thinking about doing this uh, story set 100 years before Kirk and Spock, he was in. He yeah. pretty much says that. He pretty much says it all the time. It's like, so, as soon as I heard it was, as soon as I heard it was before, 100 years before Kirk and Spock, I was in. So. I can't imagine how awkward it was because I do remember there was a huge controversy around people demanding that they change the captain, like that, it, that that's why they didn't like the show was because of him. And I just think it'd be such an awkward thing to go through where people are like, you're the reason why I don't like the show. We need a younger, hotter captain. And like (laughs) the studio didn't even like reconsider that or even be like, that's going to happen. Or we're not even like, we're not even humoring that idea. But the fact that that's like feedback that you get, that'd be so tough, you know, like given his age and everything, like it wasn't even like he was like, you know, old or that that was even a bad thing, but just the way that people like responded Mm -hmm. and, critiqued him just seems so out of place considering it's like well Picard's a lot older why why was that not an issue or why do people have so much issue with Scott Bakula but I mean by the time that the feedback came through and they were going into the fourth season then the show started mm-hmm. getting really good so I feel like that changed yeah. a lot of people's minds yeah I think um I think a lot of people did not like Enterprise when it first came out and, you know, and this is kind of weird that we're talking about this again, but, you know, history has kind of repeated itself now. Yep. Uh, they were they were vicious on this me- uh, the message board saying, like, this is way more advanced than Curse Enterprise. Yeah. Um, they, stuff like that. They were complaining about that. They were complaining about a lot of things about, enterprise being like you know this is not a prequel and and i feel like that's really know. tough to do though like i saw that yeah. same thing happen with star wars like the prequels yep. for star wars are often are met with the feeling that it's obviously seems way more advanced than you know the sequels that take place being developed in the past it's like well you're going to have to break that like thinking a little bit because it's just the way it works which you can work around it like i'd say for some of the later star wars movies that happened they were very Mm -hmm. careful and they had the resources to make it look like something that happened before or during the sequels the original movies and like that takes a lot of time and patience and money and resources to capture that like just looking at the chances where they've had to recreate set and film and scenery from the original series that would have been so tough to do and it like just how much they put into something like in Deep Space Nine, doing that recruit, you know, traveling back, like the, the Tribbles yeah. episode. That took a lot of resource to do that and emulate the original series. So it's real, it's unrealistic yeah. to think that they would try to spend all of that on a series beforehand. And it's supposed to be its own story. It's not meant to be, it's a hundred years before. Like it's even more so than the gaps between any of the other series. So who's to say, right? Like things could have yeah. changed quite a bit in those times. And it's so funny to hear people be like, this doesn't feel like the original series. It's like, cause it's not supposed to. A lot of stuff changes in a hundred years in a, in a world where things are that advanced. Like that's not, that's not unrealistic to think that this is how society is right now, but just things people get, you know, nitpicky about, which I can understand, but also, yeah. I don't know. I think a lot of people need to realize they have to view some of these shows on their own just the same way people criticize discovery and criticizing anything that doesn't feel like their track which has been kind of an ongoing theme for us just like you know reflecting on that like what is like star trek and our trek mm-hmm. and their trek like the fact that even exists is kind of annoying yes yeah so that's pretty much what was going on a lot of fans were like you know I think fan toxicity killed Enterprise. Yes. I mean, absolutely. It, it, with coupling with the franchise fatigue. Yep. Of of of, of Star Trek at that time. It wasn't because... a weird thing because I was pretty young. I mean, like I was, I watched the entirety of the show on TV. Like I was just right on the edge of you know Voyager finishing up when I was a kid, and then. Deep Space Nine being around too, still being shown, and Next Generation being on TV, still like kind of airing here and there. Mm-hmm. But actually seeing the show from beginning to end with my dad, and like I really liked it, but it was just so lost for so, pe- so many people. Lost on shows like Lost and other shows coming out, and people just kind of not really caring about Star Trek. Like 
watching an elementary school trying to get people excited about being like oh I love Star Trek you know it's the guy with Kirk and Spock but it's like its own series and people are like eh. like I don't even know what that is and I don't <laughs> care so kind of had that feeling of like it wasn't well liked or people didn't really care about what it had to say and that felt kind of weird but I personally always have liked Jonathan Archer for somebody who's supposed to be the first captain taking on like truly the unknown and the infancy of the Federation. I feel like it was the perfect way to be written of being curious, maybe a little too curious sometimes. He wants so much to be a mediator and to stick his nose in places he probably shouldn't, but yeah, part of his yeah. curiosity. But that's what, it, yeah. you know, it makes for some good story time, even though I think out of any of the other captains, he's probably had the most beat ups and tortures and fights and interactions <laughs> negative interactions with aliens like lots of lots of combat <laughs> yes yes totally yep um yeah so yeah but like the first two years he's kind of like this like you know naive explorer yeah and then the zindia zindia attack happens in the third yeah. season in the at the at the end of season two going into season three and he becomes a very dark character um yeah. especially like you know some of the questionable choices he does during the the mission to the delphic expanse and stuff like that would probably like quit uh what is it, the word to describe it would be um uh not very star trek like um yeah so it, it, he emulates a little bit of cisco when regarding that because you know yeah. they're kind of like the, the end of the the end game like the ends justify the means, like yeah. you know, like you know, he like Cisco tricked the Romulans into the Dominion War. He kind of like does a lot of things that would like you know, because I'm like my planet's gonna d- just be destroyed if I don't do anything. And that's like so we've seen we've seen characters get into those situations. Even now, Picard falls yeah. into that with Picard yeah. because we get to see that end game thinking and the desperate like decision making that some captains have to make that kind of paint them as darker characters or you see a darker side of how they justify and rationalize their decision making yep yep so yeah so that's pretty much uh yeah so yeah and then during the third year um you know all those choices he made you know like cloning trip and uh to save the ship from this this field that they were going to shut down all their systems and pretty much leave them dead in space or, you know, you yeah. know, let the clone live and then die, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and not only that, um, stranding a group of aliens when they had, when they needed a warp coil and they couldn't trade it away. So yeah, some of the things that he did or also or torturing a person just to get information yeah that was very that not was, starfleet <laughs> yeah very nice. which to be fair that's the whole thing of like it's all just kind of starting up he's one of the first you know trial runs of how how much can we uphold starfleet code of honor like er, is it really that yeah. easy to follow in real situations or is it just easier to do so on paper and you can ignore it otherwise like and we get to kind of see that like play out mm-hmm. of like how how good is he at following <laughs> following orders and actually yep. being okay with protocols like always being like oh they're supposed to have computerized probes that can visit planets and discover new stuff but he's always going to send an away team and go in person if he can and do that little way yep. riskier a way riskier take but for the outcome of like wants to you know, meet face to face. He wants to deal with things in a direct matter, and yep. you know, and he just wants to solve everything. And he's such an idealist. Yeah, yeah, and that's pretty much what it was. I, I, I just keep on bringing up the third year because that's when his character changed from being this uh, naive explorer to a hard nosed war commander. I should say. Yeah. Uh, Which yeah. I think it's a really cool growth because we don't see that really. I mean, we sort of see Janeway change a bit, but she's still very much a like she still stays pretty true and static to her character. But 
Archer does a huge like 180 throughout his time, which is cool to see. He's not just like the same character and he's unmoved by and unchanged by things that are thrown at him. But usually it seems that he's kind of figuring that out himself and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. And that's pretty much what it was for the third year. And then doing all the, the and then finally coming to terms with what he did. Fortunately, he had to yell at the Vulcans in order to make it happen, but, yeah. you know... Like, Which is so funny, like, he's usually like, such a calm and reserved person. Yeah, I mean, he was always again. he was always, like, a little bit, no offense, but he kind of is the first racist captain. He does not like the Vulcans very much. <laughs> yeah, he does not like the Vulcans very much because they, because he feels that they held back humanity's uh, warp program yeah and you know right rightfully so i i mean i get where he's coming from um it feels like they're calling I mean, the shots for humans yeah. more than humans are because his dad yeah. was a uh, was one of the developers was, of the first warp core or like warp, like warp engine yep exactly yep so that's why i believe that I, I, and i get i get where he's coming from i do so about that but then like, in the fourth year where things got good but unfortunately it was the final year uh, <laughs> and that was mm-hmm. because and that was because of a whole lot of things i mean enterprise had a lot of problems yeah. not 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 just in the writing or direction of the show or anything like that but also it was also due to the fact of studio interference um, as well it was also due to them uh like some of the big names that were champions of star trek for 10 plus years left the network yeah uh, and stuff like that starting to see of... the fall of series and writers leaving yeah like the writers yep. strike yeah that, that doesn't necessarily writers strike but mostly like like some of them you know came on and stuff like that some didn't last one year exactly yeah. like you know like for example i watched the blu-ray documentaries brandon braga had fired almost all of the staff after the first year uh the writing staff because they were not good um yeah. you know with the exception of only a couple exception of only like three people who were also like producers and writers you know and stuff like that but then they brought in john shiban from the x-files and that was a major coup uh at the time in 2002 because the x-files was just ending was ending yeah so they he brought he was brought in for season two he did a few episodes and then he left and then uh there was stuff like that in the third year it was kind of up and down regarding that terry metallis was on the sh- on the on board at that time he's now producing picard um stuff like that and then in the fourth year you bring in well, you brought in Manny Cotto in the first third year uh, as a writer, but then he becomes the showrunner for the final year. He brings in Judith and Garfield, Reeve Stevens, to write episodes to help connect the dots, and you know, and Enterprise in its as a whole starts to be its own show, and then unfortunately, it just crashes and burns in the final episode. No yep. offense. I yeah. know <laughs> it is so very much like I tried really hard to conceptualize it and like it and be like, oh, I could get it, but it's just a huge letdown. It just, yes, it's a letdown. It's, it seems like a, it's like a cheap, like a, a cheap out to the story and to just like make it feel like it was all for nothing. You know, like a very weird, like what was the point of all of that? Like yeah. why? <laughs> yeah. Why well, was, what was the point of that? You know, it was just, yeah. I, I, I consider these are the voyages to be, um, the biggest f u to the fans ever yeah uh, <laughs> all that for just a theoretical cool like that was very unnecessary cool bye yeah like, cool bye this is literally <laughs> yeah. how it felt <laughs> the only saving grace is the final two minutes that's it yeah um with all the enterprises flying by with all the f- audio from patrick stewart and mm-hmm. and uh william shatner but um but yeah that's when archer changes a little bit he comes more of like the future captains that would come after him like 
yeah. Kirk and Cisco and Janeway and Picard and, and that was my biggest thing that was him. hard because you watch a lot of that and you sit there and wonder how is it that this is supposed to be someone that Kirk looks up to <laughs> and he's like his like idol and all of this because I'm like that's a big undertaking for somebody who's supposed to be like an, one of the most amazing captains like prestigious captains in Starfleet history and you're telling yep. me that Archer was his idol like uh, they, it's hard to commiserate those yeah. two thoughts it's like it feels like you're trying to push that too hard without giving me a reason to believe it because i'm not believing it right now based on his character yeah and that's and uh, yeah it's 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 kind of crazy that you know that one event in his life changes him for either the better or for the worse depending on how you look at it um yep. and yeah i see that all the time and like one event changes like anybody's life you know because obviously yep. this india attack was obviously a parallel to what was going on in the time with 9-11 yeah so and it was you could tell it was obvious obviously 9-11 throughout the third season that was pretty much they're saying like here's our here 9-11 happened in our universe here's what happened in the star trek universe yeah. over 100 years later from there from now so and so like that and you know and i think enterprise has gotten a lot more appreciation since it's been with the distance and stuff and people being able to appreciate it now and rewatch it and can understand like what it was trying to do and like i i think it's really great like i actually some people don't like the whole like him being written with like that enmity towards uh, vulcans and people don't like that but i really like it because it's realistic honestly like it feels Mm -hmm. real more realistic that you'd see we don't often see that struggle of aliens kind of being abrasive with each other and being like i just don't get you i don't personally get you and i kind of don't like you and but we get to see that with like andorians to humans we get to see that with humans to vulcans like we get to see that kind of abrasiveness and kind of understand like that it was probably a huge thing to overcome like with people even having their own like like inner species fighting and conflict now you're talking yep. about other species having to get used to each other and it's like if spot can sit there and be bullied as a kid for being half vulcan by vulcans what does that say about humans and vulcans getting along but you get to see them overcome it and you know to paul gets to be this person that proves that he can't generalize a whole species and that it's not fair and that he realizes he's wrong and thinking that way and grows and then you can see the future yeah. of star trek being like that's what it takes people have to get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable they'd be comfortable with being uncomfortable and understand yeah. their biases and that it's okay if like it's okay if you have some preconceived notions and biases as long as you're willing to grow and you know distance yourself and learn from them don't just sit around being like that's the way i think and that's the way it is you see these characters are flawed and have kind of weird views about things like like archer not liking vulcans because of their cold mannerisms but then understands and appreciates it along the way because he often has to paul as someone who he trusts and almost like somebody i mean he puts so much trust into all of her decision making and it ends up helping him so much throughout the series yep yep and it it takes not just you know, with the trust that he will eventually, he gets eventually with the Paul and stuff like that. It also has to do with the fact that, you know, he has the Katra Surak in his head for during the, the time when the Vulcans change into what they're supposed to be in the original series. More of like a more like, a, what is it, more secluded, you know, society and stuff like that, where they're not militaristic very much. Mm-hmm. They're more, they're more pacifist and stuff like that, where they were in the original series and going through the rest of the series, rest of the franchise, and stuff like that. But before then, um, but before then, they were like uh, militaristic and stuff like that. They were openly conflict with Andorians and stuff like that. It's yep. just it takes it, ta- it takes him being having with the Paul on his ship, but then also with the with the Surak thing in his head during the fourth year. Um, helps them, you know, understand, you know, like, okay, I think I was probably in the wrong by feeling that way. And there we go. And that's the yeah. end of that. That that's the uh that's that's how I feel about Archer. I mean I mean I, I kinda liked him more of the dark character than I did as the idealistic explorer explorer. Because it's just 
because what comes after him, like people like Philip Giorgio and Michael Burnham and uh, all those other characters that come after him, you know, they're more like they're more like I think they got some inspiration from Archer, you know, yeah. when they it's probably read Starfleet history. Because like captains are like that's why I like I, I personally I mean he I think he deserves to be among the ranks of being regarded as a good like a good captain, important captain in mm-hmm. Starfleet, obviously because he's written that way. Yeah. But also, I mean he he goes through the struggles of being someone who's not static that changes because of the experiences he's had. Like a lot of captains go through some pretty traumatic and intense stuff. And it'd be weird to see them stay the exact same and not change at all from those experiences. So it's pretty cool to see him actually, you see that in kind of like a darkness of like the negative effects. Like sometimes it grows them for the better, but it's cool to see it that they actually explored a bit of like, well, for better or worse, this is what he sees now in the world and how he is. Yeah. Yep. And that's pretty much like all the captains so far that we've talked about have gone through like traumatic experiences. Um, like obviously Archer with the Zindi arc, with the with the Zindi war saga that they call it. Um, but then also with uh, Kirk, I don't know exactly what he went through. I don't remember exactly, but um, maybe just trying to rescue Spock and stuff like that. That could have been like a little bit dark, a little bit like that, trying to save Spock and, you know, bring back Spock back to life, you know, lost his son, that kind of thing, traumatic experience, stuff like that. I mean, Picard went through torture yeah. as, twice. <laughs> I should say yeah. twice because he went with the Borg and then with the Cardassians three years later. And then um, Cisco with losing his, losing his, his first wife and the Borg attack. And then having and, to also just be amicable and realize that there was a Picard that was doing that. That's tough. Yep. Yep. And going through that and then also trying to do whatever he could to save the Federation during the heights of the Dominion War. And then Janeway, obviously traumatic experience with obviously stranding her ship in the Delta Quadrant, but then also with other things as well. Could have been, I, I don't know what other else has gone on, but I forgot. I forgot. It's been like a while. But, um, but definitely stranding the ship, obviously, is a dark moment for her and she comes to terms with that later on, obviously, you know, when they're stuck in that void, but, you know, blames herself for it, obviously, but that's what they, all these captains so far have gone through a traumatic experience. And then when we talk about the Kelvin Kurt next time, the next time we do a character analysis, obviously he has gone through a lot of trauma himself, you know, yeah. obviously growing, growing up with a dad. Which was such, a, like such an important part of his character in, in, in right. the original series timeline. Yep. Makes for a totally different, yet somehow still similar. You see the true character shine through. Yep, totally. Okay, I think that's about it for Jonathan Archer. I know it's kind of feels kind of short, but you know it's all good. And any final thoughts, Kenzie? No, I'm just. I, I wonder if anyone out there if that's their favorite captain. I'm curious if he is because sometimes, at least when I hear favorites of captains, it's always usually Picard or maybe Kirk. But I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of people say yeah. that, like archers are favorite and if it is i want to know why because i think it's important and i wouldn't discount yeah. anyone for saying so no of course not i'd be kind of curious to know why you think uh, why people would think archer is their favorite i mean mm-hmm. i mean because you know granted he has the, the shortest other than kirk in the first in terms of episodic star trek um second shortest uh life in terms of being on tv um like like only extended one year longer than Kirk was, but you know he's. But I'm curious to know if anybody actually really does think they're he's their favorite captain. You know, yeah. I mean, because personally, he's not my favorite. Yeah. But like I said, but like, like I said before, it's Cisco. But mm-hmm. um. But 
it's it's all good. It's like, you know, I would love to hear if you guys if you are listening to this episode and you think, oh, this is why I like Archer. Let us know. All right. <laughs> I guess the next time we'll be talking of t- talking will be like probably after we do the virtual premiere of Star Trek Picard season two. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably we'll be talking about our experience doing that. Um, that. Definitely talking about the first episode by then for sure uh, of season two. Hopefully it'll be very good. I hope. Uh, <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. I mean, yeah. I'm looking. I can't. I can't wait for Picard season two to start in a few weeks. So I know. I'm I mean, excited it, too. Because I, I mean, granted, I think a lot of people are are very excited about it because they're willing to give Picard another chance because uh, a lot of fans either loved or hated season one, yeah. the way it was, the way it was structured, the way it ended. Personally, I think Picard season one ended a lot better than when it started. Yeah, it was kind of a bait and switch feel where I was like, the, where, the, where this is going, I'm feeling a little like detached from it. But as it started finalizing out, I'm like, oh, now this is getting interesting. And this seems really cool. Yeah. And I tell people, I'm like, you know, a lot of us will sit around and say we waited three seasons for Star Trek to get good for so many series. Give this one a chance and don't write it off because the beginning episodes did sit right with you. Like, Yeah, exactly. You've given them a lot more time and I'm sure time will be like we'll we'll make it all better too because people will have more of a chance to look at it as a whole as more episodes come in and i think people will appreciate it more as they instead of just like right off the bat first few episodes being like eh, not into it it's like well now that we're, once we're in like a couple seasons few seasons in like people can start really like deciding that better yeah and i think eventually and i'm gonna say this right now i think the rest of the shows like discovery and picard and lower decks and whatever and prodigy and whatever comes after them um will eventually get the same kind of like you know appreciation and fan acceptance as enterprise eventually has gotten yeah um it, it took it took until probably it took about four or five years before enterprise got the fan appreciation and that's mainly because of the reference of the Kelvin Scotty in the first Kelvin movie about Admiral Archer's prize beagle that, you know, if yeah. people didn't, I know I always laugh about that. Yeah. <laughs> the, way, the way he ends that was hilarious. It's like, I know that dog. What happened to it? I'll, I'll tell you when it reappears. <laughs> yeah. It's like, whatever you like, Oh, that better not be about Porthos. Like, just like yeah oh, exactly no. yeah exactly so that's why i'm thinking it's gotten a lot more appreciation since the kelvin timeline yeah. movies and discovery have made um references back to it and i have a feeling that strange new worlds will do the same yep so uh and that's why i'm hoping that scott bacula makes an appearance as archer somehow that'd be super that, cool I mean, it'll be super cool obviously yeah so okay so the next time we talk it'll be de- uh, in being like <laughs> after Picard season two's premiere. So take care and live long and prosper. Live long and prosper.